there, Joshua chapter 5. I'm going to begin reading at verse 10, and I'm going to read down to verse 12. I'm going to be reading in your hearing out of New King James translation of the Bible. If you have it, say amen. I can't hear you. If you have it, say amen. If you don't, say wait a minute. Amen. And the word of God reads this way. Now the children of Israel camped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at twilight on the plains of Jericho. And they ate of the produce of the land on the day after the Passover, unleavened bread and parched grain on the very same day. Then the manna ceased. On the day after, they had eaten the produce of the land. And the children of Israel no longer had manna. But they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. I want to go back to verse 12 because I want to underscore what's, what's being said here. Then the manna ceased. Somebody said it ceased. It stopped. It halted. On the day after they had eaten the produce of the land and the children of Israel no longer had manna. But they ate food of the land of Canaan that year. And I'm going to use a simple subject this morning. When the manna ceases. When the manna Ceases. Now, now, I, I, I just want to say to somebody, this word this morning is going to be prophetic for somebody. And so I want you to do this for me, for those who are not here, who you know they may need to hear this word. I want you to check in on your electronic device, share it on your Facebook, share it online. Amen. Let somebody know that the word of God is about to be ministered because I believe that somebody is going to receive a prophetic word from somebody, from, from God, regarding where you are in your life right now. God spoke to me very strongly this week and talked to me to talk to you about what happens when the manna ceases, when it stops. And I believe that as the Lord uses me, that there are going to be some things shared that are going to really help you through this moment and through this season in your life. Amen? Amen. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to get right into the Word of God. Amen. Father, I pray for every person in the sound of my voice that you would bless them to hear what the Spirit is saying. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. My, my baby son uh, doesn't claim to be a preacher, but one day he was preaching to me, and I'll tell you why. Here's how. Uh, he was in high school, and he was bothering me, Brother Don, about this uh, game system that he wanted, right? I don't know if it was Xbox or PlayStation 2 or one of them games, but it was the latest, the greatest, the hottest thing. All the high school kids had it. Everybody wanted it. He wanted one, too. It was very expensive. And you have to understand my son, Bryce, out of all my kids, and I have five of them, out of all my kids, he's the one kid that normally doesn't ask for much of anything. Right? All my other kids, if I ask them for something, a list comes out. Pop! <laughs> they got a list of things that they want. But he's one of those kids, he didn't never ask for much. He doesn't always ask for a whole lot of things. And so when he asks me for something, I know he really does want it because he typically will go on without really bothering me about anything. But you know, you know how your parents do when your kid asks you for something and you don't really want to give it to them? What's the, an what's the answer you give them? I'll think about it. Right? So when he asked me about it, I said, I'll think about it, which basically means no. <laughs> it basically means no. But I'm saying to him, I'll think about it. But he's one of those kids that you can't give him an answer like, I'll think about it, or maybe. It's got to be definitive. It's got to be either yes or no. He'll accept either one, but you can't leave it in the gray, Sister Carmen, because he's going to keep on coming back. So I made the mistake of saying, I'll think about it. So he's going to help me think about it, sis. So every time he saw a TV commercial with the thing being displayed, he said, Dad, there it is right there. Check that out. That's what I'm talking about. I said, yeah, okay. And we go through a store, and we walk past the item in the store, and he said, well, Dad, look at this. This is what I want right here. I said, I'll think about it. 
Then he goes, he'll have the ad papers that come in the mail. You know, they stick that stuff in your mail all the time. And he starts showing me the ad paper and said, Dad, here's the thing I want right here, right here. And I'm saying, all right, I'll think about it, right? I didn't do it. I didn't give it to him right then. But one day what I decided to do was go ahead and just give it to him. Right? It wasn't his birthday. It wasn't a holiday. It wasn't nothing special. Because I'm one of them kind of people, I don't have to wait for a special day to give you something. I just do it just because. Right? How many American people know what I'm talking about? You appreciate somebody that's doing something for you just because. It's not your birthday. It's not the holiday. It's not a special day. It's not an expectation attached to it. I just do it because I love you and I happen to be in the store and I felt good and I had the money and I thought about him and I bought it and I brought it home. He was so excited. Oh, my God. He was so excited. He got the thing that he wanted, man. And, and he's appreciative. And he spent a lot of time with it. And because he was the only, he was the last baby at home, it was his entertainment. He did all kind of stuff with it. He had fun and all this. I mean, he, he would spend hours in there with this toy. And you'd have to go make him go to bed. Turn that thing off. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't those kind of kids, sis, that you know how sometimes you give your kids a gift and they play with the box, but they don't play with the toy? And how mad that makes you? If you just wanted a box, I would have gave you a box. I'm going somewhere with this. But he, he was a person who enjoyed the thing that I gave him. He wanted it for a long time. He desired it. I gave it to him. He appreciated it, and he loved this thing. Flash forward about a year and a half, and he gave me to go to college, Right? And we, we're packing him up, getting him ready to go to school and everything like this. And he's leaving things and taking things and leaving things and taking things. So I grabbed this item because this thing was expensive. <laughs> this wasn't a little cheap something. This thing was expensive at the time. So I grabbed the item and I said, Bryce, you going to take this with you? And here's where he started preaching to me, Sister Carmen. He said, for where I'm going, I won't need it anymore. I don't already preached. I can go and sit down now. Here was this expensive toy that I just knew he loved because he begged me to death to have it. But now on his way to college, he said, I don't need that because for where I'm going, I don't need that anymore. And I concur because for where he was going and the class that he, take, that he was taking, he didn't need no toy. He needed tools. He needed like computers. Computers. He needed like laptops. He needed stuff to compete in the environment that he was walking into. So in his mind, even as a young man, he was thinking, I don't need toys. I need tools. He was preaching to me. I got so excited, I ran down the hall in my office, Carmen, and started writing this down. Because what immediately came to my mind was the scripture that said, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. And the reason why it struck me so hard is because I started thinking about all the things that we accumulate in our lives that we think we need that we beg for these things, that we are in prayer for these things, that we believe in God for them, all these things that we think we have to have to be happy. And our life is just a conglomerate or, or, or a gathering of all these things that we think we need only to discover that we didn't need it as bad as we thought. How many things we accumulate in our lives that we believe that our eyes are bigger than our stomachs, that we wanted it because we saw it or somebody else had it and we just had to have it only to realize that I'm in another stage in my life and I don't need it as bad as I thought I did, that it wasn't as necessary as I thought. And listen, it may not be a bad thing, right? Let me be clear right here. It may not be a bad thing. It may not be a sinful thing. It may not be a bad thing. It's simply I outgrew it. How many things in our lives, how many people in our lives, that it may not be a bad person, and it may not be bad. In fact, what I asked for, I wanted at the time. It was necessary at the time. Like my son, it was necessary. He was the last son at home. He spent a lot of time by himself. All the other kids were gone. So to entertain himself, he had the game system, and so it became necessary at the moment. But now that he was graduating to another dimension in his life, he didn't need the toys anymore. Is anybody talking to me right now? So, so, so sometimes what happens is when I'm, when I'm in a certain place, I feel like what, I'm, what I have or what I ask God for is necessary because of the place I'm in now. But now that I reached a certain place, I no longer need it. See, as long as he was in his daddy's house, in his mama's house, he felt like he needed it. 
But getting ready to prepare for adulthood, he realized that the things I thought I needed, I don't. Made me proud because my baby boy was growing up. See, you can tell when a person is growing up by the changes in their appetites. I can tell when you're growing up spiritually by the changes in your appetite. I appreciate this church so much because I can get here and talk about things that may be heady, that may make you think, that may make you go, hmm, and you can receive it because this is a thinking church. We're not just a shouting church. We do shout, but we're not just a shouting church. We're not just a singing church. We, we don't get happy just because people are singing, but we have an appreciation for the word. And I can tell where you are spiritually by your appetite. I appreciate the singing. I appreciate all that. And I appreciate the worship. See, when I get up and I dom this stage, I'm thinking about the word that's going to be ministered to you so that you may grow thereby. Therefore, I'm not going to sing a song before I preach. I'm not going to sing a song before I minister. I'm not going to be uh, concerned about trying to find keys and notes because that's not my assignment. See, if you just wanted to sing and dance and shout, you should have got your praise on during the worship. See? Yeah. Welcome to the Impact Church. You should have got it in then. But now that it's time to minister the word of God, my assignment is to give you the word of God that you may grow thereby. And so in this room and watching me online or individuals who tune in not to tickle their ear, not to entertain them, but to edify them and give them something that will help them fight some devils this week. How many know you got some devils to fight this week? So their appetite, your appetite begins to change and your appetite changing for church is a sign that you are growing up that you are maturing, that I can appreciate all these other accoutrements that we have in church, but my real reason for tuning in and for coming in this room is so that I may get a word from God. There was a time that I came to church because it was fun. There was a time I came to church because I knew Sister Mabel was going to run and I was going to have a good time laughing at her. There was a time I came to church because the choir was rocking. There was a time I came to church because I knew somebody was going to sing a song. And I still appreciate all that. But what I appreciate even more is the word of God that is being ministered to me so that I can grow into a productive Christian as I am supposed to. Anybody with me so far? What am I saying? I'm saying that certain things, certain things, Michael, just don't do it for me anymore. That's what's happening. Certain things, when I start growing up in the spirit, certain things just don't do it for me anymore. My ability to be fed, my ability to, to, to have certain desires, my, ability, my taste, my God, my taste for certain things is changing. My tolerance for certain things is changing. That certain things, I don't get nothing out of it anymore. Right? It's not that I don't do it. It's just that I don't, I don't appreciate it like I used to. And it's not an issue of age. It's an issue of stage. That as I move into a certain stage in my life, certain things just don't do it for me no more. Like, for example, certain things are not funny for me like they used to be. And I'm not no hypocrite. I'm the kind of person, if I'm into something, I'm into it. Right? I'm into it. You may not agree with it. You may not like it. But that's where I am right now in my life. That's the place I'm in. And I'm going to enjoy it because that's what I like to enjoy. And that's what I do. I'm not going to be fake. I'm not going to be phony. I'm not going to play with you. Some people, when you try to tell them that they need to do something, you need to stop something, don't get mad they don't change right away. It's just that they're not there yet. Because when you get to a certain stage in your life, certain things you lose a taste for. There it is. Certain things, you can fuss at people like your kids sometimes. You can fuss at them. You can argue with them. You can talk about you, all that kind of stuff. But until they get to a certain place, a certain stage in their life, they won't hear you, right? So how many of you got people that you know, you, you try to tell them, you try to say, don't do that, change this. And what they'll do, sis, is they'll placate you. When you say, oh, you shouldn't do that, like, yeah, you know, I, I shouldn't do that. I, you know, you're right. One day I'm going to change. I, I, I know I shouldn't do that, but whatever, whatever, but I'm not going to. You know what it is? I'm in a certain place. And I can relate to that because there were certain behaviors, certain attitudes, certain things that I enjoyed, even as a Christian, that I didn't feel conviction about. Y'all quiet. The, 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 there are certain things that I knew from the word of God to be wrong, but in my personal behavior, I, I, I participated anyway because I just wasn't there yet. 
And so, and so I can tell I'm growing as a believer and as a Christian because certain things that I allow to attach themselves to me, certain behaviors, certain situations that I allow to exhibit in my life, I suddenly lost taste for. Certain people I lost taste for. It's not that I don't love them. It's not that I don't like them. In fact, I still love them. I still like them. They always have a place in my heart, but I've lost taste for that. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I've lost t- taste for that kind of behavior. I've lost taste to be involved. It doesn't feed me like it used to. When I was in a place, sis, it fed me. When I was in a place, it was tolerable. When I was in a place, it was, I was okay with it. When I was in a place, but now that I'm moving and I'm developing and I'm growing, I can tell that I'm maturing, Michael, because my taste is changing. The things that used to feed me, the stuff that used to be funny ain't funny no more. And and I can tell that I'm changing, Mark, because all of a sudden I'm not being invited to things that I used to. See, as long as I supplied the drugs and supplied the alcohol and supplied whatever it is they thought they needed, then everybody was calling me. But I can tell, even without me telling people, leave me alone, certain people started backing away from me because they recognized that I'm not into it no more. I'm not, I'm, I'm not even being funny. You was okay with the last week. Yeah, I was, but now I'm not. Anybody understand what I'm talking about? That I was cool with it. I was down. I rolled like four flat towers. Boy, I'm down. Call me. We roll it. And all of a sudden, I didn't want to do it no more. Because I was growing as a Christian. I was growing in my spirituality. I was growing in my development. And I knew that there was going to be a change in my life because my appetites were changing. And a shift in your appetite signals a shift in your destiny. Oh, my God. You need to type that in the comment field. You need to tweet that, put it on Facebook. A shift in your appetite signals a shift in your destiny. I'm going to say it one more time. I want to make sure you get it. I'm going to make you understand what's happening in your life. The reason your appetite, your desires, your taste for things is changing is because God is signaling to you that I'm about to cause a shift in your life. And, oh my God, and, and, and the fact that I have to move away from this is not because nobody told me, it's not because nobody got on me, it's not because nobody fussed at me, it's just I woke up one day and I don't have a taste for it anymore. The people, I don't have a taste for you. I, I used to be okay with people who acted like that. I participated, but now I don't have the patience for it. And it's not even about age, because I know how that is too. When you get older, you start thinking differently about different things. But this is not about age. This is about stage. I was sharing with the men on a Bible class last night, and incidentally to the men, you guys need to jump on this Bible class call. This, this is for you to learn, to be taught, to grow in the things of God, right? So the men were out there on the Bible class, on the, on the Bible class call, and we're studying, and I told them, I said, you know, at this stage in my life, my prayer is, God, don't let me be an old fool. Because I understand that maturity is not necessarily attached to age. It should be. But you can still be 50, 60 years old and still be an old fool. And ain't nothing worse than being an old fool. Ain't nothing worse than being somebody who is at a place in your life where you should be mentoring other people, where you should be training other people, where you should be instructing young men and young women, and you're still acting like you're a teenager. Oh. Because although you have physically grown, you have not spiritually grown. And it's not about how old you are on the calendar, and it's not about how long you've been at a church, because you can be in a church 20 years and still be a spiritual adolescent. Why? Because you still exhibit appetites that are like somebody who is a kid. When you gave me, there was a time as a, as, a, as a human being, if you gave me milk at a year old, I was cool with that. But now I'm a grown man. And if you put milk in front of me, it's going to be a fight. <laughs> I almost tell you off. I wish you would. I'm big 220 pounds, and you're going to give me, here's your dinner, pastor, and it's a bottle of milk. I wish you would. Don't that sound crazy? 
But that's how a lot of people are spiritually. At a place in your life that you should be exhibiting spiritual development maturity, you're still needing to be developed like a spiritual baby. And I can tell that you still need milk because you don't appreciate growth. You don't appreciate service. You don't appreciate anything unless it excites you, unless it moves you, unless you're jumping up and down. We have to go into calisthenics just to get you involved. Because you don't see your maturity as something that you have a responsibility for. Look at somebody and say, grow up. So, so in our text, God is about to change Israel's appetite. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. On her development from promise into possession, she moves through these stages in her journey that are marked by, get this, distinct changes in her appetite. The first mention of her appetites is when they complained in the wilderness. You Bible scholars know this. When they complained in the, in the wilderness that he was hungry, the Bible said they desired the leeks and onions that they had in Egypt. Right? Leeks and onions were spicy. It was spicy food. So even though they had gotten out of slavery, they were in the wilderness on their way to the promised land, their appetites were still attached to their previous experience. Leeks and onions were slave food. But it was spicy. And compared to what they had to eat now, they were sitting around dreaming about, oh, back in the day. Back in the day. Oh, my. I sure wish I had some leeks and onions right now. Right? Uh, uh, It was slave food, but it was normal. It was what they was raised on. It was what they were familiar with. And therefore, it was normal to them. You'd be surprised what you can live on if you have to. You'd be surprised what you can live on if you have to. They, I mean, in fact, they tell me that, that most of the things that we call soul food now was in the day back in slavery, slave food. Mo- yeah, I'm going to go there. A lot of the food that we really enjoy now, this is soul food. Boy, my grandmother, my great-great-grandmother, we lived on this. We grew up on this. I can cook this right now. I'm not talking about what you cook. That's your business. But I'm saying that a lot of the things that we have on a menu now were things that our slave masters gave the slaves. It was the slops. Am I telling the truth? Some of the chitlins and stuff like that, it was the slops. It was the leftovers. It was after they got the good food, they gave us the slops. But as slaves, we learned how to take the slops and make a meal out of it. You, I'm trying to tell you, you'd be surprised the stuff you can live on if you have to. Well, let me go deep and cut somebody. Some of the stuff you've been eating on is spiritual slop. It's slop. It's sloppy. It's sloppy doctrine. It's sloppy teaching. It's sloppy truth. And you're just lapping it up like somebody who is glad and wondering why you're spiritually immature because a lot of the things that we pass off as doctrine is slop. It feels good. It tastes good. It sounds good. But it's not really rooted in doctrine. It's just trendy. You'd be surprised the stuff you can live on if you have to. You'd be surprised the kind of behavior you can put up with if you have to. All of us get in situations that you have to do what you got to (laughs) do. But you'd be surprised because we're adaptable. We bend, we change. And even though it's not God's ideal for you, you learn how to live with it. Some of you right now in situations that are less than God's ideal for you, but you just live with it. You live with certain behaviors. You live with certain attitudes. You live with certain kinds of people. You just tolerate it. You know God wants something better for you. You know there's a better life than you than this. You know it. God has said it. He's spoken it. He's shown you examples of it. But you don't feel like it's good for you because you're used to eating on that level. You're used to eating like a slave. You're used to living with what they give you. You're used to living with how they treat you. Oh, my God. I'm saying something right now. I'm saying something more than what you're reacting to. You're used to being treated that way, and so you just make soul food out of slop. (laughs) Shit there, I'm coming down your street. The next mention is this strange thing called manna. So he went from slave food, because that's what they wanted, and God gave them manna. The word manna in Hebrew means what is it, right? Because they didn't know what it was. 
There was nothing like it on earth. Nobody ever made this before. Nobody knew how to cook it. Nobody knew how to prepare it. Nobody knew how to put it together. It was just something that fell out of heaven supernaturally every morning, every day. For six days, it would, it would just show up. All they do is reach outside the tent and pick up this manna. They didn't have to cook it, find it, go get it, kill nothing for it. They just looked up every morning, and God supernaturally provided for them every day. Get this, for 40 years. Now, you might be able to explain a miracle once or twice, or maybe three times, but every day for 40 years? This was miraculous. This was supernatural. This was God looking out for them. Even when they were disobedient and didn't act right and complain, God still fed them for 40 years. In the, look at God's grace that'll still take care of you even when you ain't acting right. How many of you know about the grace of God that just blesses you anyway? Wait, I mean, let me come up close. Where are my real saints at that realize that the things I have from God a lot of times, I didn't even deserve it. It wasn't because I always lived right or acted right or did the right thing. It's just that God's grace and mercy on me, he blessed me anyway. If there anybody in here who's glad that God blessed you anyway, you lost your temper, you lost your cool, you cut somebody out, you said something you weren't supposed to say, but God supernaturally blessed you anyway, blessed your kids, gave you a raise, kept you on your job, healed your body, and I dare you sit there and act like you deserve it. We're the real saints who know that God blessed you anyway give God a praise right here I, I want the real saints I'm not the fake saints I want the saints who just know that God's just been it's been the grace of God throw your hands up and say it's been the grace of God if the enemy had had his way I wouldn't even be here today because if the enemy had his way I wouldn't have made it here I would have been dead in my grave but because of God's grace and because of God's mercy and because of God's hand even when I wasn't acting right he still was being right because he's God and he loves you somebody give God praise 30 seconds right here for God's grace I mean I want all the faithful people to give God praise right here I mean take 30 seconds right here and give him your best praise I'm not done with you yet This manna, although it wasn't like leeks and onions, it wasn't tasty, it wasn't flavorful, but it was so strong that it sustained them for 40 years. It was abundant in supply, and it kept them for 40 years walking in the wilderness. We cool with this. God is still providing. And then one day, one day, they went outside, and the Bible says, and the manna ceased it stopped I mean the thing that's been sustaining me and keeping me and holding me together to look up one day and I got used to it right you know how if you get used to something you ain't even got to think about it what's for breakfast manna what's for lunch manna what's for dinner manna what we having tomorrow manna what we having next Thursday at 3 o'clock manna God is so faithful when he provides for you, he doesn't make you have to worry about it. Once God decides to bless you, you ain't got to worry about no devil, no demon, no, no witch, no warlock, because God has just decided to bless you, and you start getting comfortable with the grace of God and the blessings of God, and one day the manna just stopped. Out of nowhere, no warning. It wasn't like God said, okay, in 30 days, I'm going to stop. You ain't have time to get yourself ready for it. You just went outside one day and it stopped. After 40 years, it stopped. But I want you to get this. The manna ceasing was a signal that God was about to change their appetite. I know that you're shocked and you're appalled and you're nervous because the things, the people that you depended on have suddenly stopped. Stop supporting. Stop coming. Stop being encouraging. Stop being there for you. But God said to tell somebody that the manna that is ceasing is just a sign that God's about to change your appetite. Oh, let me tell you why that's important. There is a direct connection between desire, appetite, and destination. Everything we do is driven by desire. And people go to where they need to to fulfill a need. Good or bad. Everything we do is driven by appetite. I see it, I want it. You see what I'm saying? If you have, for example, if you have a desire 
for righteousness or right living, you'll seek out places where that's encouraged or being developed. Right? If I want to live right, do right, act right, I start seeking out places, I'm seeking out teachers, I start going to church, I go to places where that part of my life can be developed, right? If I was an alcoholic, I would find me a liquor store. See, I got to go there, Carmen, because I, I try to be high and lofty, but they ain't want to go there. If you was an alcoholic, you ain't got to beg no alcoholic to go to a liquor store, you ain't got to talk them into it, they're going to find. They, you, can, you can drop them off in another city, and they'll find some place where they sell alcohol because that's what I got appetite for. Oh, my God. Uh, if, if, you, if, if you're a person that's, that's a sex-driven person, you'll find a porn spot. You'll find a strip club. You're going, oh, my God. You're going to find it. You know all the sites. You know where to find it, how to locate it. You know where to find it in the city, my God, because that's what you are into. If I want to know where you're headed... All I got to do is check your appetites. All I got to do to know where you're headed, Mike, in your life and in your future, I ain't got to know what all the plans are. All I got to do is find out what are your appetites. Because your appetites are, are, are connected to your destiny. Oh, my God. Your desire drives direction. That's why, that's why Jesus said, they that hunger and thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Because if that's what you have a hunger for, God said, I'll supply it. Whatever you have a hunger for, a thirst for, that's the thing that's going to drive you to the thing that you're going to. So I don't, have to, I don't even have to know uh, uh, where you're going to end up. I don't even have to get prophetic and look into your future and tell you where you're going to end up. All I got to do is check your appetites. Check what you got a taste for. And your taste will tell me where you're going to end up. Anybody ever done this? Get ready to go to eat and you say, uh, what you going to eat? What's the first thing we ask? What you got a taste for? Right? After church, we're going to all go to dinner, go somewhere to eat. And somebody's going to say, Pastor, do you want to go to eat? They're going to ask me, what do you got a taste for? Because whatever I have a taste for, if I say I want chicken, we're going to a chicken place. If I say I want fish, we're going to a fish place. If I say I want steak, we're going to go somewhere where they serve steak. You don't go someplace that doesn't supply your appetite. I'm not going to a chicken place if I got a taste for steak. So if I have a taste for certain things, I can tell you where you can, I, you, you can almost guarantee where I'm going to end up based on what I say I got a taste for. So when I talk to people and I listen to people and I minister to people, I'm checking in on what they have a taste for because that determines where you're going to end up. But God said, I'm going to change your appetite. I'm going to give you an appetite for right things. I'm going to you're, you're starting to see a change in the things that you enjoy and the things that you feed on and the things that entertain you. You're like my son. You're starting to feed on something different because I'm growing up spiritually. How many people are glad that you're growing up spiritually? Nobody had to come get me or fuss at me or threaten me. It's just that something on the inside began to change. Am I talking to anybody in here? This is why you can't hang out with certain people anymore. This is why you can't go to certain places anymore. It's not that you're so spiritual or deep or better than anybody else. It's just that my desire changed. And I'm sorry that you think I'm acting funny because I'm really not. It's just that my appetite has changed. My appetite's changed. So I'm going to write this down. I'm going to talk to you about the season. Right? Because, because the, the man of ceasing was a sign that the season had changed. Because notice the timing. The manna stopped after they tasted the crops. Ooh. I never realized that. That means that although they were eating manna every day, sis, one day, God allowed them to taste the crops from Canaan land. And once they got the taste in their mouth, the manna ceased. <laughs> and the manna ceasing was God announcing that you were in another season. That's what's wrong with me. The reason why that doesn't feed me anymore like it used to is because I'm in another season. If you can go back to what you were going to before, after you tasted this, it means you ain't grew up yet. I'm in a different season. 
And what worked for me in that season doesn't work in this season. It's not that it wasn't, it's not that it was bad, it's not what it was wicked, it's not what it was crazy. It's just that in that season it worked out good, but now I'm dissatisfied with something that I used to be satisfied with. And I want to talk to somebody in here who is dissatisfied with something that you used to be satisfied with. I used to be okay with this. In this season, look at this, you're gonna finally eat what you've been hoping for. <laughs> In this season, you're, go you're moving away from just hoping and wishing and wondering. You're going to suddenly find yourself walking into the things that you've been singing about for years. How many people are ready to walk into their new season? You've been in a losing season. You've been in a waiting pattern. You've been in a hoping season. But God is going to finally move you to a place that you start living in the thing you've been thinking about. God, you ain't hearing me. You're going to start possessing the things you've only been singing about. How many people are tired of singing about something that you never possess? You singing about it, dancing about it, hoping for it, jumping up and down, but you ain't received it. But God said in this season, I'm about to push you into the things that I've been showing you. Some of y'all been waiting for something to happen for four and five and six years, 10 and 20 years, and it hasn't happened. And God said for this season, I'm about to push you into the thing that I've been promising you. And you'll know that it's time when your appetite changed. I know I'm ready for it, God, because my appetite for it is changing. There was a time in my life I wasn't ready for that. There was a time in my life where God said, I want you to have this. I wasn't ready for it. I wasn't mature enough. I didn't have the right mindset. I still wanted to do what I wanted to do. I still wanted to play. I still wanted to walk around and do it. But suddenly my appetite started changing. And then the Bible says, the manna ceased. Let me, let, me, let me drill down there some more, because here's what I know. Once you get a taste of something on another level, it's impossible for you to go back. That there are certain things that once you get exposed to them, you can't get the taste out your mouth. You can't go back to, once you've been exposed to a certain level of ministry, you can't comfortably go back to where, where you used to, oh my God, where you used to be. I don't understand people who get exposed to greatness but feel comfortable still going back down to mediocrity because there's something about being exposed to it, being around it, seeing it, tasting it that said, this ain't it, this ain't it. I ain't, I'm not trying to be funny or nothing, but this ain't it. If you can leave here and still go back to that, that means you have not grown up yet. Oh. The Bible said it was impossible for those who have tasted of the gift of God that if they should return, if they should, re if they should, uh, if they should, uh, 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 if they should fall away to ever be restored. And know what God said? This stuff I'm going to give you so good, you ain't never going to be able to go back. You ain't never going to be able to go back. When my daughter was a preteen, I took her out on her first date. I took her out on her first date. And I used to do it every year. We get dressed, we get dressed up, and I would take her out on a date with her dad. And I did the whole thing, sis. I would take her out and I'd get the car washed, right? We'd get dressed up. We would pick out a really nice restaurant. It wasn't no McDonald's. It wasn't nothing like that. I would take her to a real nice restaurant where they have valet and everything, right? I, we open the door for her, and I'd usher her in and pull out her chair, and, I, and, and the people come out and snap the napkin and put it on her lap and all that, and let her pick anything off her menu. And I said to her, I'm doing this because I want you to understand what love looks like. And if he ain't coming like this, reject it. You parents need to teach your kids what love looks like. Because once you've, been, once you've been exposed to real love, it makes it easy to reject a counterfeit. I'm going to teach a series in this church, how to identify an imposter. I'm going to teach a series, maybe next month, how to identify an imposter. Because it's hard for you to identify an imposter if you don't know what the real thing is. So I taught my daughter how a man is supposed to treat you so that when she runs into these other jokers, you can say, not you, not you, not you, not you, not you, okay. Because this is what I've been exposed to. Oh, my God. She called me up about six months ago and said, Michael, she said, Dad, you made it hard for me. I said, how? She said, because you raised the bar so high that these jokers can't reach it. 
they think I'm stuck up. They think I'm funny. They think I'm weird. It's just that my daddy set a bar for me that's so high that anything else I reject. Your father God said, I'm raising a bar for you. And anything that's less than what I'm trying to give you, you have a right to reject it. You don't hear me. You got a right to say, no, not me, not here, not that. But if you, oh. Exposure messes you up, sis. You get the taste in the mouth. Once you've been exposed to certain things, you can't go back. And some things are impossible to forget. Once you've been loved right, you can't go back to anything less. People tickle me trying to get you to eat something and you know it ain't real. I, I was at a place one time and they said, this is authentic Mexican food. And I tasted it. And I said, that ain't real Mexican food. How do you know? Because I've been to Mexico. And I ate real Mexican food. And I ate it the way they prepared it. And when I tasted what you gave me, I said, that ain't it. <laughs> Exposure messes you up. Because once you've been exposed to certain things, you will not accept certain things. I went downtown, and this guy said, oh, come on in here, man. We got real Philly cheese day. Really? Oh, and there's time and everything. This is authentic Philly cheese day. Well, I'm from the D.C., Delaware, Maryland area. And we went to Philly all the time, they ate cheesesteak. And I took one bite and said, this ain't from Philly. <laughs> I don't know what you call it this, but this ain't from Philly. You know why? Because I've tasted the real thing. Baby, ain't nothing like the real thing. Oh, my God. That's why well, I don't know what kind of church you've been tasting, and I don't know where you've been eating at, but if you get this God that I got, you... I'm not saying you're perfect. I'm not saying you do everything right. I'm not saying that you're all that. But what I am saying is that I know the difference between what's real and what's not. And you can't fool me. You can't fool me. You can't fool me. You can't fool me about an anointing. You can't fool me. And a lot of the stuff we call anointing is not anointing. It's just talent. Why? Because I've been exposed. So that's what God does when he wants to elevate you another, to another level. Don't always be so resistant. God exposes you to it to create an appetite in you. Anybody ever been to these grocery stores and on the end cap, there's somebody on the end cap that got a toothpick with a little sample of food? <laughs> and you're walking by, they said, taste this. You know what they're trying to do? They're trying to create an appetite in you. You ain't got to have the whole meal. All I need is a taste. And a taste is enough to send me on a drive to say, I got to have this. I don't know what all this is, but I've, I've tasted something. Let me go here because they don't want to. It, it, it's like what the drug dealers do, brother, brother, brother Don. <laughs> I hate to go there, but some of y'all ain't going to get it. I got to put it there. It's like what the drug dealers do. When they're trying to get you hooked on a certain kind of drug or a new drug, they let you have the first hit free. <laughs> You don't pay $100 for this hit. I'm going to give it to you free. Because I know that once you get this hit, you're going to come back looking for me. God said, I'm better than the best dope dealer you ever had in your life. Once you get a hold of this here, once you get, that's why the Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I ain't even got to have the whole Bible. I don't have to have a theology degree. I ain't got to know everything that's in there. All I need is a taste. And a taste will send me on a journey. That's what brought me back to church. I got a taste. That's what left, that's what helped me leave the club. I got a taste. That's what got me away from drugs. I got a taste. And once I got a taste, I had to keep on coming back. If there's anybody in there that's ever had a taste, give God praise right here. A taste. Well, a taste. It was a taste. Taste. Because what God is doing is creating appetite in you. So he exposes you to his anointing and his ministry because he wants to create something in you. See, this is what I know about people. Once the desire is in them, you ain't got to keep telling them what they need to do. You ain't got to fuss something about coming to church. You ain't got to tell them you ought to serve. You don't have to tell them you got to give. Once you get a taste, there's something inside. My appetites have changed. See, on a normal Sunday morning, if I wasn't a saved person, I'd be getting ready to go back to the club that I just left last night. So the reason why I can't be at church is because I'm resting up because I just got in at 4 in the morning. The fact that I'm here this morning 
Me, my appetite changed. <laughs> Look at somebody say, my appetite changed. There was a time I'd be engaged in something else, and I'd be making plans to do something else, but my appetite changed because my season is changing. Somebody said my season is changing. Let me talk to you about scarcity, and I'm moving on. Sometimes what God will do is he will cause you to experience a season of scarcity. That's number two, scarcity. Because you'll never be able to enjoy this stage in your life as long as the manna is available. Yeah, let that sizzle in your spirit. As long as the manna is available, you won't have a desire nor motivation to go into your new season because you're still crying about your last season. That's why you can't move past that relationship and be open to a new relationship because you're still fussing about the last relationship. Yeah. Yeah, you can't move into your new dimension because you still got nostalgia about your last dimension. And all your conversations are about what God did yesterday. And so you, it's hard to move people into another thing when they're still crying over the last thing. It's hard to move you into the next level of glory if you're still bragging about the last month's glory. It's hard to move you into a deeper experience as long as what you had before is readily available. So what God does is he cuts off the manna. He causes it to cease. He makes it where you can't get back to it even if you wanted to. And because he cuts it off, it forces you to go into this new diet. I would have gone back. See, some of you, the problem is you have a desire to go back to certain things. Everything back there wasn't bad, Michael. I know people say that sin is bad, but everything about sin ain't bad. I ain't got no real church, folks. Yeah, everything about it. Some of that I really enjoyed, Angela. I did. I was in it to win it. Yeah, I like this right here. But what God did when he delivered me, he made it where it wasn't even possible to get back to certain things. Why do you see certain people blocked you? <laughs> Why do you think certain people lost your number? God, God makes it scarce. What he does is God cuts off the supply. So don't worry when you see things changing. Things you were used to. People you got used to. Scarcity just means he's going to provide for you another way. Don't get nervous when the things that you used to start getting scarce. You can't find it. I can't get to it. Scarcity just means that God is going to provide for you another way. In fact, what I'm going to give you next is going to be better than what you had before. Y'all not happy about this. Yeah, 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 yeah. What I get, if you stop crying over that, then I will give you this. If you stop having nostalgia over that, I'll give you something better. Oh, my God. See, you'll be tempted to seek out and chase down whatever you... See, I hate, I hate losing stuff. I hate losing stuff. I hate losing friends. I hate losing relationships. I hate losing opportunity. I just hate... This is, this is the thing in me, Carmen. I hate losing stuff. And when I lose something, I'm busy trying to find it. So when people walk away from me, I'm the guy that be always trying to figure out how to fix it. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? I'm always that guy. You stop calling me, I'm calling you back. I'm emailing you. I'm texting you. What's wrong? What's the problem? What's the deal? What because I hate losing stuff. I hate losing friendships. I hate losing employees. I hate it. And I'm the guy that's going to be calling you and texting you and trying to come get you and figure out what's going on with you. Because I hate losing stuff. I hate letting go of stuff. But listen at this, ladies and gentlemen. You'll be tempted to go back and go find it. Go back and get it. But here's what God said to tell you. Whatever you lost, you don't need it. For this next stage in your life. So stop wasting time. Stop calling them. Stop texting them. Stop going to get them. Stop riding around their house. Stop looking on lurking on their Facebook. Whatever. Oh God. If people were able to leave you like that. God said you didn't need them for the next stage in your life. Good God almighty. Look at somebody say I don't need it. If you needed it God would have made it stay. 
If you needed it, it would have never got away from you. If you needed him, God would have never let them get away. If you needed her, if you needed that, God would have never cut off the supply. But the fact that he let the supply cut off means you don't need it anymore. You ought to be glad about that. I don't need it because God's about to provide for me another way. So the job closed down. I got another job. So she left me. I got somebody else waiting on me. So they walked out on me. I got somebody better. So you don't want to be around me. I got somebody more qualified. Look at the mind and say, you don't need it. You're wasting too much energy trying to recreate something whose time has passed. That's what's wrong with you. You're stuck in a place because you're busy trying to recreate something for something that has already passed. It was good for that time. It was good for that season. It was good for that situation. But now that you're moving into something else, you don't need that anymore. So stop wasting energy. You can search. They can search all over town. They can search all over the city. They can search all over the valley. They couldn't find manna anywhere. And here's what God said. He never did it again. So this wasn't going to be a temporary interruption in your source of supply. God said, I'm done with that. Here's what I found out. I found out that whatever God has done with, you need to be done with. I found that out the hard way. Because anytime God is done with something and you're still trying to resurrect something that God has killed, you are out of order. You're frustrating. And sometimes I try to resurrect stuff that God was done with. I'm done with that. That was when you were an adolescent. Now you're a man. That was when you were a baby Christian, now you're growing up. That was when you were small and didn't know who you were, but now you're turning to somebody. That was when you didn't know what you was going to do or where you want to go with your life, but now you're stepping into your destiny and the things that fed you there can't feed you there, can't feed you here. And so God said, I'm going to make it scarce. Scarce is scary. I like to have abundance. I got, I got a thing. I got a thing, Sister Angela, about not having food in my house. Because I know what it's like as a kid not to have food in our house. We were so poor sometimes we didn't know we was going to eat dinner. It might be a day or two before we had dinner. I'm not lying. It's no lie. We were so poor, we were so broke that you weren't sure if you were going to have dinner. So as a grown man in my 50s now, I got a thing about not having food in the house. I do. You ever come to my house, you want to see cupboards full, <laughs> refrigerators full. I have stuff in my refrigerator stay there so long it just spoils. It got hair growing on it. I ain't lying. I don't even cook it. I just have it. Because I got a thing about scarcity. Because once you've been without, there is a fear that I might not eat again. So I overbuy because I'm afraid of scarcity. And God says some of you are afraid of scarcity. Nobody's going to love you. Nobody's going to support you. Nobody's going to be there. You've experienced people abandoning you. You've been hung out on a limb. You've been kicked off of jobs. You've been kicked out of opportunities. You've been, you've been lied on and talked about and kicked aside. You have experienced what it's like to need help and nobody comes. You have experienced what it's like to be looking for help that never comes. Have you ever done it? Have you ever been standing there looking out the window, hoping that the cavalry come and they don't? And that fearful, anxious, nervous, uh, stomach wrenching, nerve wrenching feeling of waiting for something that never comes, waiting for a ship that never comes, waiting for help that never comes, waiting for a meal that never shows up. But God said this scarcity for you is just going to be a sign. I'm about to feed you another way. I'm more faithful than that. I'm going to make sure if I shut you off here, I'm going to feed you. Oh, my God. I'm gonna... Don't take the scarcity as a sign that God is punishing you because all God is doing is pushing you. You lost some friends. You don't have as many friends in your phone as you used to, and you're really upset and feeling lonely. But God said you need to be open to some new friends that are going to take you into something better. You have friends that want to take you back into something lesser. And I'm going to give you some folks that's going to take you into something greater. Oh, my God, who am I talking to in here? 
Somebody lift your hands and say, Lord, I'm open. I'm open. I don't know what this is. I've never been here before. I don't know what it's going to be like. But all I know is, God, I'm open. I've never seen it before. I've never tasted it before. And all I know, God, is an open. And the scarcity in my life is just a sign that God's about to do something great. Somebody give God praise for what he's about to do. God said, I'm going to do something that's going to blow your mind. I will say that, Lord. The reason why some of you hold on to yesterday is because you don't know that God can do something greater in your latter day. You think that your best days are behind you. And God is saying your best days are in front of you. You think that all that God was going to do is what he did yesterday. That's why you always live there in yesterday, in yesterday's bread, in yesterday's experience. Because you don't have the faith to believe that God could do something in this day that will eclipse everything he did yesterday. Woo. God said to tell somebody what I'm about to do in your life is going to totally eclipse everything oh my lord oh my lord the things i'm about to do are going to outlast outpace eclipse i'm going to do it so good you're going to forget about yesterday lift your hands and say lord i'm open to it i'm open i'm i'm, I'm going to step into a better job a better position i'm going to step into more love i'm going to step into more opportunity i'm going to step into more favor i'm going to step into healing i'm going to step into blessings i'm going to step into prosperity and if you're ready for it throw your hands up and say lord i'm ready for it whatever you have back there you don't need it it's time to move into your prayer last thing is this i'm going to talk to you about the stability see the israelites were largely an agricultural people they were farmers but throughout this whole wilderness journey they hadn't farmed in over 40 years, right? The last time we saw the Israelites working on a farm doing agricultural work was in Egypt, right? So that means that they were farmers on somebody else's land. They were farmers on somebody else's property. And God said, when this manna ceases, I'm going to move you from being on somebody else's property to owning your own property. I hear God saying to somebody here, it's time for you to stop leasing and start owning. Y'all ain't happy about that. J that you get ready to be the head and not the tail. That the tables are getting ready to switch and you're going to be the lender and not the borrower. That God said, you got to let go of that season because in that season, you couldn't be the lender. You had to be the borrower. But for this new season, you're about to be the lender. Y'all, oh my God. You're going to be the person people look to to give as opposed to being the person that needs to receive. Somebody needs to be happy about that. For 40, look, look at this, look at this. For 40 years, they had not had to farm. They had not had to. They just walked outside, got the manna. Here it is. Boom, I'm here. But not only that, their kids had never farmed. They grew up in the wilderness. All they ever knew was manna. All they ever knew was this kind of bread that came down from heaven. They didn't know anything else. They didn't know anything else even existed. They were born in this. You know how it is when you're born in something, it's your normal. This is what it is. I accept it. This is cool. And now God had caused the thing they got used to to stop. And causing it to stop was God saying, I'm going to develop something else in you. I'm going to push you into something else. See, here's what I know about God. God doesn't supply where there's no need. See, so in the wilderness, he supplied manna because they needed it. But in Canaan land, Canaan land was lush. It was fruitful. There was grain everywhere. There was food everywhere. There was grapes. There was, there was honey. I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was an agricultural dream. So I'm confused because I'm used to just walking outside and just getting it. But now God was pushing them into a place of stability. I come and talk to somebody and say that God is moving you from a place of want into a place of stability. Your wilderness is over. The days of begging and borrowing and robbing from Peter to pay Paul, those days are over. The days of trying to find a friend, beg for a friend, buy a friend, those days are over. 
The days are trying to convince people to be around you. You're not going to have to chase them. They're going to be chasing you. The days are trying to get around great people because you want to be noticed or over. Now you're going to have great people trying to find you. You ain't happy about this. The days are trying to put yourself in a position where somebody will notice your gift and your talent. God said, I'm about to change it, and they're going to pay you for your gift and for your talent. Good God Almighty. I wish I had some church up here. I wish. Look at somebody say, it's changing. You, you better get a selfie with me now. You better get my autograph now you better get on my page now because in a minute my scene's about to change and you're not gonna be able to access me like you used to oh my god certain people are not gonna be able to access you like they used to they're not gonna be able to get near you like they used to check with my secretary check with my security check with my aa you're not gonna be able to just walk in and see me oh let's see look at somebody say it's changing it's changing you may not see it on the outside, but on the inside, my appetite's changing. The fact that I'm sitting here today is a sign that my appetite is changing. The fact that I came and sat in the service and I didn't just leave after the worship means that my appetite is changing. 40 years, they, they didn't even know how to do it. They didn't know how to do it. But God was getting ready to push them into the season of sowing and reaping. That's when you know you're growing up. When you get mature enough to understand that it's not magic. That there is a sowing season and a reaping season. That you understand that what I receive is directly connected to my efforts. See, kids think they just, see, here's how kids do, sis. They just show up at the kitchen table and they think food show up magically. How many kids, how many know what I'm talking about? That's how kids do. That's a kid mentality. What's for dinner? You show up at the table and you sit down and somebody puts a plate in front of you. That's because you're a child. As an adult, I understood that somebody had to get up and get dressed at 4 or 5 in the morning and drive through traffic and go to a job that I possibly hate and deal with people all day long that I didn't want to be bothered with and then get back in my car and drive all the way across town and stop at a grocery store and walk up and down the aisle and pay for the food and cook the food and prepare the food so that you can eat. That's what grown folks understand. So I know I'm growing up because I'm not looking at things like a kid anymore. Feed me, feed me. I'm looking at how I can provide for the house that I take. Oh, my God. God said, I'm about to bless you to be a giver. I'm about to bless you to understand how to make things happen. I'm going to show you how to pull things together. You're moving into a new season. This is not abracadabra. This is not hocus pocus. God said, I'm going to give you principles and plans and ideas that's going to take you into the next level. And you're not going to need manna because this is going to be stable. See, when your life is unstable, you start doing desperate things. When you're not sure where your next meal is going to come from, you start doing desperate things. When you're not sure that anybody's going to love you, you start doing desperate things. That's why you go from relationship to relationship, because you don't understand that there is a season that you have to be single. You're investing more time in trying to find the right one than you are in trying to be the right one. Woo! Faith and sit down. They ain't ready for you this morning. You running all over town and running over here, and you got a string of boyfriends because you're still trying to find. Are you the one? Are you the one? Are you the one? Are you the one? And after about 15 years of doing that, you have to finally realize it's time for me to be the right one. And if I become the right one, I'll attract the right one. Oh, stop. Stop facing. They ain't ready for you this morning. They hit the organ. Hit the keyboard. They want to dance. They want to shout. You ain't ready for no real meat this morning. You wasting too much time. You waste too much time trying to find the right one. And God is pushing you to a place of stability so that you can be the right one. I don't need you to come in my life to give me a house. I'll get my own house. Where are my single sisters at? I'll get my own car. I'll get my own money. Ain't nowhere in the world God wants my daughters to be unhappy unless you come. The devil is a lie. 
God's about to bless somebody to be stable. Oh, Lord. Anybody been feeling unstable in this whole economy with COVID, with issues, with vaccination? Your life has felt a little bit unstable, but God said, I'm about to stabilize your life. I'm about to stabilize. I'm going to stabilize your life so much, you're not going to compromise your Christianity to get what you need. Woo, you ain't ready for this. You're not going to have to dumb down your message to get what you need. you not got to compromise who you are and how you are and how you live and where you go. You're not going to have to be somebody different because God is going to bless you anyway. Somebody shout hallelujah. The man of stop was saying to them, basically, it's time for you to go to a higher dimension. It's time to go to the next level. It's time to go up. It's time for you to go for the next thing. And you're going to frustrate yourself trying to be fed from an old source. That's why some people don't like church, because you're trying to be fed by an old source. And God is trying to get you off of the pablum. Get you off of the entertainment. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of glad for it, to be honest. I'm kind of glad for it, Carmen, in a way. Because we have invested so much money and energy and effort. We get together in groups and teams. Mark will tell you, just trying to come up with ways to entertain you. Let's do this. Let's have a party. Let's go skating. Let's go dancing. Let's go have a da 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 We come up with all these things trying to entertain you because we're dealing with people who are used to entertainment. Rather than edification. God has put a cause on things to get your appetite together. The wilderness, the manna was only designed to clean your palate. So you can be ready for some real food. I'm going to say this and I'm going to close. But I understand it for some of you. I understand what it is. Anybody remember uh, many years ago, the Peanuts character, the Charles Saltz, it was uh, Charlie Brown, the Peanuts characters. I'm telling my age now. Some of these young people are like, What? The Peanuts character, there used to be a character on there named Linus. And Linus was, uh, every time you pictured him, he had a, a blanket. Yeah, he was, he was a security blanket. He ate with it, slept with it, went to school with it, worked with it. Everywhere you saw him, he always had this blanket. He had to have, he couldn't go nowhere without this blanket. And all through the comic strips, you see people trying to snatch this blanket from him. You know, the dog tried to snatch it all the time. His sister would terrorize him by snatching the blanket one time she snatched it and hid it and, and, and burned it in the ground. And he like that went into a coma. He, he went into depression. He was just, I mean, he, he couldn't get himself together. He couldn't think. He couldn't eat. He was darn near dead before they finally gave it back to him. And when he got his blanket back, he suddenly went back to his normal self. Some years later, when Charles Sauce began to write, rewrite the, the, the comics, he wrote into there at one point where Linus gave up his blanket to his friend and everybody knew that he always had to have this blanket he just couldn't survive without this blanket and he gave it up to him and, he, and they asked him well, after all these years of fighting with you and arguing with you and pulling with you why are you suddenly able to let this go and he said because I finally realized I don't need it anymore I said that to say to some of you right now, you, God is pushing you into a place and you feel a little bit unstable because God is trying to take certain things from you. Certain behaviors that you think you need. Certain things that you indulge in that you think you have to have. That I'm cool, I'm going to be a Christian, but I got my little something, something over here too. I got my little thing on because without this, I'm going to feel scared. I'm going to feel uncovered and I'm going to feel unstable and I'm going to feel like I can't, I can't get myself together. And, 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 and here's the essence of faith. God says, if you, if you trust me enough to give it up, I'll give you something better. Here's the deal. If you trust me enough to let that go, I got something better for you. I got something that's better. You ain't had no love. You ain't had no love like this. You had temporary, conditional love. As long as you do what I say, when I say it, how I say it, how I want it, then I love you. Conditional. And God said, I got the kind of love that will look past your faults and see your needs. See, you're dealing with people who give up on you if you don't do 
what they want you to do. But I'm the kind of God that won't give up on you. You make mistakes, people fly out the door. Do something crazy. Do something stupid. Folks start leaving like rats off of a ship. But God said, I'll stick with you. I'll stay with you. I'll work with you. I want to trade with you. Give up whatever you got in your hand and get on what I got. I'll give you a peace that passes all understanding. You're trying to find it in a hit. You're trying to find it in a bottle. You're trying to find yourself in the arms of somebody that makes you feel peaceful for a moment. But God said the path, the peace I'm going to give you is going to pass all understanding. It ain't going to make no sense. People are going to look at you and wonder, why do you have so much peace? How are you able to keep yourself together? How are you able to walk through this, a single mom with two, three kids, and you don't need no sugar daddy? What? I'm giving up that daddy so I can have this daddy. Y'all not going to talk to me. I'm giving up that so I can have this. I'm giving up on them so I can have him. So I lift your hand and say, Lord, I'm trading today. Let's make a trade. Let's make a trade. Let's make a trade. God said, let's make a trade. I'm about to let everything that you've been depending on cease because I want you to myself. I'm pushing you into another level of faith. I'm pushing you to another level of, of glory. That's why all the TV you watch it, all the craziness you watch it, it's not feeding you because God said, turn the TV off, turn the radio off, turn the Facebook off and get in this word. Get out of the Facebook and get in the book. Y'all ain't happy about that. Some of you, the first thing you do in the morning is jump up and open your Facebook. But God said, you're about to have an appetite in you that you're not going to be on social media every 15 minutes. Why? Because I'm in my word. I stopped looking at your face because I want to look at his face. The man is about to cease. I'm trying to warn somebody that the man is about to cease. You're going to reach for certain people and they're not going to be there. You're going to call certain people and you're going to be blocked. You're going to be on social media and trying to figure out why you can't see their timeline. And God said, because I've made the manna cease so that you can have something better. Lift your hands and say, Lord, I want something better. Right here. Somebody begin to worship right here. I want something better. I want something better. I want something better. Lord, if you got to stop the manna for me to get myself together, then stop the manna. If you got to cut them off, if you got to shut them down, if you got to cut them loose in order for me to get the glory, then I want the glory. I'll leave wherever I got to leave. I'll walk away from wherever I got to walk away from. I'll turn my back on wherever I got away from. My eyes will have tears on it, but I will walk away because I want your glory. Lift your hands and give God glory right here if that's what you want. Lift your hands and praise him right here if that's what you want. Stand up on your feet all over this building. I'm closing out.